All right, this is Babylon Magic and Religion, uh, part two, and we're going to continue where we left off. The mention of the pure Abolition House suggests that the ceremony in question was performed at the temple, but this was not invariable. In other cases, the rites might take place in a private house, in a sick room, in a reed hut alongside the river, or in the open country. Another magical technique, and we are still reading from uh, The Babylonians by H.W.F. Sags. So if you'd like to hear or read any more of this book, you'd have to purchase it. But, um, yeah, and, you know, I put this on the web to help help people with questions. So hopefully, you know, that's what you use it for. Anyway, um... Another magical technique was substitution. A good example is provided by a text from Asher, of which the following is an abridged edition. For making exchange for a man wanted by the goddess of death, at sunset the sick man... Hold on. Okay, this is for this technique, magical technique. It's for making exchange for a man wanted by the goddess of death. At sunset, the sick man will make a kid lie down with him on the bed. At dawn, you, that is the priest, shall get up and bow to the sun god, which would be to the east. The sick man shall carry the kid in his lap to a house where there is a tamarisk tree. You, the priest, shall make the sick man and the kid lie down on the ground. You shall touch the throat of the sick man with a wooden dagger, and you shall cut the throat of the kid with a bronze dagger. You shall then dress up the kid with clothes, but sandals, put sandals on it, put eye black on its eyes, put oil on its head. You shall take off the sick man's turban and tie it on the kid's head. You shall lay the kid out and treat it like a dead man. The sick man shall then get up and stand in the doorway whilst the, pierce, the priest repeats a charm three times. The sick man shall remove his garment, give it to the priest, and go off. The priest shall then set up a howl for the sick man, saying, So-and-so has passed away. The priest shall then give orders to institute mourning, and shall bury the kid. Magical procedures of the kinds quoted go back, in their simplest forms, at least to the third millennium, perhaps to prehistoric times. But it was not until a much later date that collections of such texts were made. The three principal collections are known as Sherpu, Maklu, and Utuki Limnudi. The first two titles both mean burning. But the two kinds of burning were distinct in their functions. Maklu incantations were mainly to counter the machinations of human wizards and witches. They were uttered with wax, wooden bronze, or tow images of the witch who had brought the evil were destroyed by fire. So here you have something like the voodoo doll in ancient Babylon. The Maklu incantations. Sherpu ritual, on the other hand, was a means of getting rid of sins, offenses which had brought ill upon the sufferer, whether ethical misdeeds, ritual shortcomings, or breaches of taboos, were transferred to some object which was then burnt. Utuki, Lamuti, means evil spirits, and it was to exercise such things that these incantations and rituals were used. So the Utuki, Lamuti, Limnuti, um, is the art of exorcism at this point in time. These three types of conjuration were far from being the only ones. There is a text which contains an extensive catalog of titles, which according to its first line were series which are prescribed for learning and study for the exorcist priesthood. This list contains, in addition to those already mentioned, such titles as headaches, toothaches, to loose a curse, I ache to cure snake bite to cure scorpion sting, magical rites for town, house, field, orchard, river. King Ashurbanipal sought such magical works for his library, and we have a letter in which he gives an official a list of his desiderata. Desiderata. The hosts of evil spirits which threatened the Babylonians and the Assyrians were of many kinds. There was Lamash too. Already mentioned, the dreaded she-spirit who threatened women in childbirth and stole infants. Equally dreaded was Namtaru, the, the plague demon, the messenger of Nergal, god of the underworld. 
Rabisu, the croucher, was to be met with in doorways and dark corners. Lily, too, probably the Hebrew Lilith, was a succubus who visited men and disturbed their slumbers by lascivious suggestions. Born from such unions were creatures such as the Alu and the Galu, faceless monsters who would rend those who came into their power and who, to judge by the corresponding form in Jewish tradition, clustered around the bedside of a sick man to greet their father after death. There was also a particular type of malevolent spirit which haunted the open country, described as the evil Utok Utuku demon, which kills a fit man in the steppe. In addition to these, there were the plain ghosts of dead humans, the wraiths of those who had died by violence or in consequence of infringement of a taboo. And now I'm going to stop real quick, and I'm going to go over to uh, Rosemary Ellen Guiley's Demons and Demonology Encyclopedia. Utuku is a type of Babylonian demon who can be either good or evil. A group of evil ones are known as the Seven. They are offspring of the sky god Anu and the earth goddess Ki, and they act as assistants to the underworld world god Nergal. In Akkadian lore, the Utuku are servants of the underworld, whose task is to fetch the sacrificial offerings made by humans, especially the blood, the liver, and organs of animals. The evil Utuku are the Ikimu, and the good ones are the Shidu. Interesting enough. Now back to the Babylonians by H. W. F. Sags. Uh, whether a ghost that was slain by a weapon, or a ghost that died of a sin against a god or a crime against a king, were particularly liable to wonder, to wander, as was one neglected by its family in the matter of funerary and memorial rites. Quote, a forgotten ghost, or a ghost whose name is not uttered, or a ghost who has no one to care for it. Not only could such ghosts strike terror from the, into the hearts of those they haunted, but they might do actual harm. The following is an example of the kind of procedure used to deal with this menace. Now, what's interesting here is even back in Babylon, you know, the ghost story, the typical ghost story is still around. And, and the same type of, um, you know, theories on causation of a haunting are still there. Let's go back. Um, see, whether a ghost that was slain, what was, okay, a murdered individual, or they sinned against a god, or they've done a crime against a king. Um, also, the ones that were neglected by their families and didn't have, like, you know, their tombstone was missing or they weren't properly buried. So, food for thought there in your modern day paranormal world. Um, the following is an example of the kind of procedure used to deal with the menace. The officiant prepared unleavened bread from specified ingredients, while he recited the following incantation three times. Dead folk, why do you appear to me? You whose towns are the ruins. I do not go to Kutha, the assembly place of the ghosts. Why then do you come after me? Be ye exercised by... And then you would name the deities that you wanted them exercised by. As the sun was setting, this magic bread was introduced into a newly dug hole through an ox horn. A censer was set burning, and as a column of incense rose to the setting sun, the officiant recited another incantation calling upon Shamash, the sun god, to exercise the offending spirit, and, quote, whether it be an evil spook or an evil alu or an evil ghost or an evil galu, or a buried ghost, or an unburied ghost, or a ghost without brother or sister, or a ghost with no one to mention its name, or a ghost which was left in the desert, appoint it to the keeping of the ghost of its family. Finally, a wax image of the sick man was placed in the family grave together with clay images of the ghosts. This had a twofold intention. It laid the ghosts by token burial, and it deceived them into believing that their victim had died. An alternative cure was available if a ghost could be definitely identified. A clay figure was made and assimilated to the offending ghost by inscribing its name on its left hip. It was then rendered helpless by twisting its feet, throwing it down and putting a dog tooth in its mouth as a gag. 
After making a libation to the sun god, the officiant recited three times, I conjure you by Shamash at his sitting. Get clear of the body of so-and-so. Depart, be gone. The rubric adds, You shall bury that image in a hole at sunset, and as long as he lives, that man will not see the dead ghost. Demons can be diverted from their attacks upon a man by the provision of a substitute, such as an animal or even an inanimate object, such as a reed of the man's height. Whatever it was would be brought alongside the sufferer and identified with him in detail. The text for one such ceremony, using a goat kid, explains, An evil Asaku demon dwells in the man's body. It covers the man like a garment as he walks about. It holds his hands and feet. It paralyzes his limbs. There is then an obscure mythological reference to Ea, god of magic and wisdom. This introduces the mythological reference to Ea. Who read that again? This introduces the text for the ritual. The kid is the substitute for mankind. The kid is given for his life. The kid's head is given for the man's head. The kid's neck is given for the man's neck. The breast of the kid is given for the breast of the man. The belief that if a demon was exorcised from a man, it was necessary to provide an alternative home underlies the New Testament story of the Gadarene swine, in which pigs were taken possession of by the multitude of demons expelled from a single man. The desirability of providing an exorcised demon with an alternative home is reflected in a New Testament parable. This is in Saint, uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 43 through 5. The unclean spirit, when he has gone out of the man, passes through waterless places, seeking rest, and finds it not. Then he says, I will return into my house whence I came out. And when he has come, he finds it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goes he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits, more evil than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. Not all demons were ill-disposed to mankind, for some incantations conclude, Let the evil Utuku and the evil Alu go away. Let a benevolent Utuku and a benevolent genie by present. Well-disposed counterparts of the malevolent powers included good Utuku spirits, good representatives of various other demonic species and beings known as Shidu and Lamusu. Lamasu. The last two could take various forms, and to ensure their presence, the Babylonians and Assyrians made several kinds of representations of them. Amongst them, the huge winged bulls and lions which stood at the entrance of Assyrian palaces as protection against evil. A private house or bedroom might be similarly protected by figures standing at the doorway or buried under the threshold. At Ur, for example, the excavators found clay figurines and boxes of burnt brick under the floor against the walls. The figurines, which had been lime-washed and then painted in black and red, faced into the center of the room to guard it. They were of various kinds. Some took the form of humans clad in a pointed hat and a long robe painted with scales. These were the fishmen, the creatures mentioned in mythology. And uh, we've talked about those before. Other figures had human bodies at the heads and wings of birds, and some represented a benevolent-looking, long-bearded, long-robed godling, with his closed hands folded across his breast, as though grasping something. Uh, with his closed hands folded against his breast, as though grasping something. Yet others were clay representations of the Mishkushu boy. Mushkushushu, or dragon. We'll just call it a dragon from now on. A composite creature with the body of a dog, the head of a serpent, and a long tail. Now remember when we were talking about the lion's paw and what we just read about the closed hand folded across his breast as though grasping something. So even back this far, you're seeing these same symbols. You know, this is like 4000 BC, guys. We have the text of the ritual for setting up figurines of this kind to protect a house. It begins by enumerating possible causes of the misfortune which had inflicted the dwelling. Whether it be an evil ghost or an evil spirit, or an evil spook or an evil ghoul, or an evil god or an evil croucher, or a lamashtu, or the Caesar, or Lilith, or plague demon, 
or death, or heat, or fever, whatever there may be which does harm to a man in a man's house. Instructions are then given for the preparation of magical figures of wood and clay. You shall sprinkle holy water, set up a portable altar, offer lambs for sacrifice, set up a censer with juniper wood, pour out a wine libation, do obeisance, purify the censer, torch, holy water vessel, and tamarisk wood, and speak thus before Shamash, or the sun god, O Shamash, great lord, exalted judge, the one who supervises the regions of heaven and earth, the one who directs aright the dead and the living, you are the holy tamarisk, the pure wood for the form of the statues, which I shall cause to stand in the house of so-and-so for the overthrow of evil beings. And remember, guys, biblically, this was, you know, biblically this was done away with. Why? Because, you know, you're worshiping wood and sticks, in essence. So, you know, be that as it may. The tamarisk, therefore, or thereby assimilated to the sun god, now had to be cut up in the approved manner. The rubric directs, then nick the tamarisk with a golden axe and a silver saw and carve it with a chisel. Gold and silver, moon and sun, people, moon and sun, and carve it with a chisel. Groups of figurines were then made from the wood, appropriately dressed and set up to the accompaniment of further incantations. At sunrise next morning there came the procedure for making figurines of clay. First the potter's clay was made ritually pure by sensing, adding holy water and other sacred objects, and reciting an incantation beginning, O potter's clay, O potter's clay. The clay was then used to make statuettes, since both terracotta and unbaked molded clay long outlast carved wood and moist soil. It is figurines of this type which have been found at Ur and elsewhere. The texts indicate that many of these clay figures were originally inscribed with magical formulas. Clay figurines of dogs, for example, had their magical names written on them in the following way. Don't stop to think, open your mouth. Name of the other dog. Don't stop to think, bite. Name of one black dog, consume his life. Name of the other dog, loud of bark. Name of one red dog, driver away of the Asaku demon. Name of the other dog, catcher of the enemy. There were more rituals to complete before such statuettes of wood and clay became operational. It was not until after further sacrifices and libations to the sun god made at the river bank at sunrise that the statuettes were finally taken to the house. There, key points of the house, corners, doorways, roofs, and air vents were touched with various purifying substances to sterilize it from evil influences. It was now up to the statuettes to keep it clean. So that they might take up their task, sacrifices were now made to them, accompanied by incantations informing them that, on account of some evil things which stand and call with malignant purpose in the house of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, I have made you stand at the gate at right and left to dispel them. Let anything malignant be removed from you a distance of a thirty-six thousand double-hour journey. The foregoing ritual is a lengthy and no doubt expensive affair, but it was efficacious against all types of evil influences, presumably indefinitely. Simpler rituals could provide security with a shorter period of guarantee. Now, what does this sound like? This sounds like the same stuff, like the holy water and the blessed salt. The holy water is like a weaker version of the blessed salt because it's it's it, it dries, basically, and salt will stay there. So you have a differentiation in the Babylonian religion and basically exorcism of... Uh, a category of ritual that is, you know, different categories and strengths. Anyways, the foregoing ritual was a lengthy and no doubt expensive affair. Da -da 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 -da, I already read that. To cut off the source of evil from a man's house, you shall pound up, bray, and mix in mountain honey the seed of seven named plants, divide it into three parts, and bury it in the threshold of the gate, and to the right side and to the left side. Then illness, headache, insomnia, and pestilence shall not approach that man in his house for one year. The kind of evil influences against which such rituals were directed did not always seize upon a man by their own volition. 
often they were directed by witchcraft. There were simple ways of doing this. Spittle, for example, had magical properties, and when one spat, the decent thing was to rub it out with the foot, to save other people from risk. But a worker of black magic might deliberately flout this precaution, and we find listed as one possible source of trouble evil spittle not covered with dust. <laughs> Crazy. Such a passage as the following form from an exorcism shows how to widespread and feared how widespread and feared witchcraft was. And this is an incantation. My witch, my bewitcher, sits in the shadow of a heap of bricks. She sits and works bewitchment on me, makes images of me. And you know, we talked earlier making images of people. You know, similar to the voodoo doll was a popular popular thing. The bewitchment which you have wrought, let it be directed against you. The images you have made, let them apply to you. The witch, the water which you have drawn up, let it be used against yourself. The laws of Hammurabi made the practitioner of witchcraft liable to the death penalty. Legislation, however, was of no avail against the dire consequences of witchcraft. Exorcism was needed to counter it, and many such texts are known. Such a text would begin with a diagnosis, for instance would begin with the diagnosis, for instance. Sorry, I'm slightly distracted today. The witch has wrought her evil bewitchment. She has made me eat her no-good spirit. She has made me drink her drink to take away my life. She has washed me with filthy washing to make me a dead man. She has anointed me with her bad oil for my destruction. She has made me catch a bad illness, which is the grasp of a curse. She has appointed me to the ghost of a stranger who prowls around, who has no kin. Treatment succeeded diagnosis. The god Asher Luhi, identified with Marduk, noted the sufferer's situation and reported the diagnosis to his father Ea, telling him that the witch has gone to tear away his life. Ea then gave instructions for treatment. Go, my son Marduk, give him your pure drink of life. Let him eat the plant of life. Let him anoint himself and wash. Reach his witch with the wind of your mouth. Let bewitchment, venom, filth be far from him. Let the curse go forth into the wilderness. Let the ghost of the stranger disappear. Let the man live. Whatever his witch has done to him, done to kill him, may Marduk loose. From the need of the illicit operators of witchcraft to practice secrecy, it is only to be expected that we should find little direct trace of their activity, but we know at least one document used in illicit black magic. It takes the form of a letter to a god asking the deity to wipe out the writer and the whole of his family and connections. It begins... <laughs> yeah, I feel comfortable reading this freaking thing, but anyways... O Ninurta, great lord, tear out the heart, extinguish the life, kill the wife, annihilate the sons, the relations, the connections, the name, the seed, the offshoot, the descendants of uh, Bawa a Adina, and ends with an oath, allegedly by the unfortunate Ba'a Adina, assuring the doubtless rather puzzled deity that Ba'a Adina and his relations bore the effect, the penalty, the guilt, the sin, the offense of this oath. Not all afflictions befalling a man were the result of witchcraft or of ill-disposed demons. A man might bring trouble upon himself by violating a taboo. Certain foods and certain activities were interdicted on particular days, and in a hemorology, or a list of lucky and unlucky days, we read, First day, a man shall not eat garlic or a scorpion will sting him. He shall not eat an onion or there will be dysentery for him. Second day, he shall not eat garlic, or an important person in his family will die. He shall not ascend to a roof, or the handmaid of Lilu will espouse him. Third day, he shall not have intercourse with a woman, or that woman will take away his sexual powers. Fourth day, he shall not cross a river, or his virility will fail. Anyways... Fifth day, he shall not eat pig meat, or there will be a lawsuit for him. Therefore, when a man was oppressed by sickness or trouble, such matters had to be inquired into or to trace the cause. It was only a step 
from this to inquiring into a man's other activities, which we, but not the Babylonians, would call his ethical standards. Thus, in an incantation, for someone who is sick, in danger, distraught, very troubled, we find a list of the man's possible offenses. All right, let's skip forward a little bit. Let's see, yeah, let's get into the other ones. Uh, in the first episode, we mentioned the uh, kind of the traditional, basically the pantheon, the main trinity of Babylonian belief structure and the gods that played you know, major parts of the myths and stuff, but here I want to go get into, um, not, nece not necessarily any less important, but they weren't like the main three. But anyways, here we go. The moon god Sin. Sin was controller of the night, of the month, and of the lunar calendar. According to variant theologists, he was the son of either Anu or Enlil. His wife was Ningal, or the great lady while Shamash and Ishtar were their children. Like the three supreme gods, Sin had a long and complex prehistory. Besides his predominant astral form, he also had an animal aspect, bearing the title Brilliant Young Bull, and a myth tells of him impregnating his consort in the form of a cow. The city with which Nana Sin was principally connected was Ur, whilst Haran in the north was also a city of the moon god. As the Bible gives both cities connections with Abraham, there have been attempts to see in the henotheistic worship of the moon god the roots of the religion revealed through Abraham, but this is highly speculative. Now this is kind of the belief of the mystery schools right there, where they try to make that connection between the moon god and... Uh, and the teachings of Abraham, which, I don't know, it's it's totally not accurate, but, you know, be that as it may, that's what this series is about. In the 6th century BC, the last new Babylonian king, Nabu Naid, attempted a religious reform based on a cult which placed sin at the head of the pantheon. As one might expect, the crescent moon was one of the symbols of sin. This was later taken over as the main religious symbol of Islam. So, you know, think about that. Shamash, in his daily course across the heavens, dispelled all darkness and could see all the works of man. By being the one from whom no secrets are hid, he was the god of justice, and it is he who is portrayed on the stella of Hammurabi as handing over the just laws to that king. He is commonly represented with the rod and ring, symbols denoting straightness and completeness. That is, right and justice. In Babylonia, his symbol was a disc with four pointed stars and rays. Think about that. The disc with a four pointed star. What does that look like? The principal cities with which Shamash was associated were Sippar and Larsa. Now we're going to get into more of the goddess Ishtar. Let's see. Although well be known bef well before the thir end of the third millennium, Mesopotamian society had the, at the conscious level become male-dominated. Sumerians and Babylonians, and you can see like the parallel, because remember, you have the Sumerians, Babylonians, and the Assyrians, and then you also have the tribes of Israel at this point, and then you have the Egyptians as well. So, the idea that... Remember, all, all these people were living in the same area, basically. So, to see parallels between them isn't necessarily totally crazy, okay? But, you know, as anybody that is listening to the Bible series as well will see, they are distinctly different. Anyways, um, and I just wanted to mention that because of the male dominance. Anyways... Sumerians and Babylonians still go gave subconscious recognition through religion to the primacy of the female principle. This was reflected in the goddess Inanna or Ishtar and in her sister Ereshkigal, lady of the underworld, 
who gave form to the dark and terrible side of this overwhelming force. Ishtar was of vast significance in Sumero-Babylonian religion. By assimilating the personality and functions of other goddesses, she eventually became virtually the only female deity, so that the word Ishtar came to be used for goddess in general. Her formidable power is reflected in the mythological fancy that she drove a team of seven harnessed lions. Seven. Here we get that seven again. Or, according to an alternative concept, of seven evil winds. A Sumerian religious text says of her, With Enlil in this land she fixes destiny. The gods of the land assemble before her, the great Anuna, do reverence to her which are the major gods, my lady pronounces the judgment of the land in their presence. Ishtar was venerated under many local manifestations, felt by worshippers to be in some way distinct, so that in Assyria we find Ishtar of Nineveh, Ishtar of Arbela, and Ishtar of bit kit Muri mentioned together. The Queen of Heaven of Nineveh, the Queen of Heaven of Arbela, and the Queen of Heaven of bit kit Muri. Now what does that sound like? Have you ever heard of the different Our Lady, Our Lady of, you know, Fatima, Our Lady of Metagoria, Our Lady of Guadalupe? Pretty interesting how that that queen worship, queen of heaven type worship, follows the same patterns. Let's see. The astral form of Ishtar, as visible in the planet Venus, was neither her only nor her major aspect. More importantly, she was goddess of war and goddess of sexual love and procreation. The paradoxical union in one deity of these two disparate conceptions probably crystallized the idea that whenever life was cut off in the violence of battle or created in the fervor of the sexual act, there Ishtar was manifest. As the mother principle, she had big breasts and four milk-yielding teats. There you go, guys. Four milk-yielding teats. The earliest known symbol of this goddess, as Enina or Inanna, was from Erech before 3000 BC in the form of what is sometimes called a gate post with streamers. This originally represented the bundle of reeds which formed the doorpost of a reed hut, of a type still found in the marshes of South Iraq. The connection between the reed hut and Inanna was that a fertility cult to which Inanna was central took place in a building of this type. Under her aspect of a sky deity, Ishtar was often represented by an eight-pointed star. Let's see. Da -da 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 yeah, we're gonna service a little, or skip a little bit here. We'll go into... and we'll just read it all. Ninurta, who is sometimes transcribed as Inerta or in older books as Ninib, represented the storm clouds which drenched the mountains in the spring and brought the flooding of the rivers. What we know of him serves as a good example of how Mesopotamian deities developed. Sumerian mythology knew of a supernatural being, Imdugud, which embodied the power of the thick storm clouds. Imdugud came to be represented in the form of a bird, and the divine Imdugud bird was given the name of Anzu. An Akkadian myth tells how Ninurta defeated Anzu, who is now considered an evil being. And the text explicitly states, Ninurta drenched the myths of the mountains when he slayed the evil Anzu. What had happened is that when the, with the development of deities in human form, the old powers earlier seen in Imdugud had become personified in the god Ninurta. But the old non-anthropomorphic powers lingered on, and an explanation was needed of the connection between the two. The myth offered this explanation. The power in the older form had been conquered by the god in human form. Now, pay attention again. The power in the older form had been conquered by the god in human form. A similar process lay behind the development of some other gods. For example, in the myth Enuma Elish, Ea defeated the primeval being Apsu to gain the subterranean waters as his realm. But allusions in other texts show that Ea and the Apsu represented the same supernatural forces as comprehended at different stages of thought. Ninurta was identified with several other gods, most notably in the third millennium with Ningirsu, deity of Girsu, the central part of the city-state of Lagash. 
He seems in an early period to have been associated with the pantheon of which Enlil was head, for he was the son of Enlil, and in some respects appears to have been virtually identified with him. Gods had numerical symbols, the number for Enlil being fifty, and Nagursu's temple at Lagash bore the name E Ninu, House of Fifty. Also one of the epithets so here we have again this association as in Greek mythology or not Greek mythology, but Greek magic in mystery schools of associating, you know, everything with numbers and you know, you have the monad and the duad and the tri triad and all that. So let's keep let's keep going. Also one of the epithets of the wife of Ninurta was Nin Nibru, Lady of Nipper. And it was Enlil who was Lord of Lord of Nipper. Da, da, da. Let's see. A powerful and much feared deity was Nergal, the god of pestilence and of the underworld. In magical text, his city, Kutha, is called the assembly place of the ghosts. And that's mentioned in Second Kings 17.24 and verse 30. As a patron deity of Kutha, Nergal had a consort of little significance called Laz. But as lord of the underworld, his spouse, spouse was Ereshkigal, the elder sister of Inanna was the original mistress of the underworld, and in an Akkadian myth, Nergal and Ereshkigal tells how Nergal became king in that realm. The gods made a banquet, and because Ereshkigal was unable to come up from the underworld to partake, she was invited to send her messenger to receive her portion. When the messenger reached the divine assembly, the gods stood up out of respect to his mistress. But one god, Nergal, withheld this courtesy, and was so was ordered to go down to the underworld. Before he went, Ea, god of wisdom, gave him advice on how to conduct himself, specially warning him not to accept food or drink, nor to succumb to the seductions of Ereshkigal. But the, terms of, the charms of Ereshkigal were too much for Nargal, and he lay with the queen of the underworld in her bedchamber for six days. On the seventh day she granted him a temporary return to the upper world, but when Nargal had gone, Ereshkigal felt a strong yearning for him, wanting him as her husband. She therefore sent up her messenger to demand the return of Nergal, employing as her sanction to enforce compliance her power to blight all earthly fecundity, fertility, and life. Nergal returned, went up to Ereshkigal, seized her by the hair, and pulled her from her throne. The pair then lay together for a further six days. Finally, a message came from the gods above giving permission for Nergal to remain in the underworld, where henceforth he reigned as king. This myth probably reflects a stage of society in which leadership by a female had become unacceptable. Let's see. I don't know, that probably... Da, 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 da. Might I might just wrap it up here. Yeah, I think they'll wrap it up for this. Hopefully he freaking learned something out of that monstrosity ever read. But uh yeah. Uh thanks for listening. Bryson Show.